Welcome to this overview of Classical Rome Part 2. You can see we're going to talk about uh, these topics here at the bottom of the screen right now. And remember, your goal is to get a big, broad overview of these things, like an overview of this fascinating clothing. Uh, notice, no pants. No pants at all. It's just everybody in togas and tunicas and all these other clothes. It's fascinating. Now, the period of Roman expansion. It seems like a good thing, right? So during the Roman Republic, they expanded more and more. Their armies marched across much of the Mediterranean basin. And so they took areas in Africa, in Asia, in Asia Minor, in Europe. And also that included the Hellenistic part of the world, so the part that had Greek culture in it. And you can even see this image here of the guy with the, the lion on his head. Um, that is an image of a depiction of Mithridates, the king of Pontus, which is in Asia Minor. And he was an enemy of Rome that Rome fought against in uh, some wars. And Rome conquered all the way over in that direction. Rome also conquered up into what is now France and over into Spain and even little bits into to what would be Germany. And all of that expansion did a couple of things. It brought in wealth. It brought in a lot of enslaved people and also a lot of new ideas. Uh, you can also see Julius Caesar down here accepting the surrender of Vercingetorix uh, in modern day France. So you can think of, start to think about that, how far Rome had expanded. And uh, Gaul is, of course, the area sort of like modern day France and the British Isles being what we think of today as like the UK or England. Um, and this was the a map of the empire at the end of Caesar's life. You can see the red there was the Roman Empire in 60 BCE before Caesar did some of his most famous exploits. Uh, Caesar participated in the conquest of chunks of Numidia down in North Africa. You can see the green there. And uh, perhaps most famously, conquering Gaul, like we saw in that previous picture, and even invading Britain, uh, though he not able to stay and take territory. Um, and that was a big deal because he was already a fairly successful person. But when you conquer stuff as a Roman, you get real successful real fast from the money and the fame. And in fact, that helped contribute to the fall of the Republic. Because if you're a Republican system based on the representation of the people, there's always this tension between the elected officials and those folks who are leading the military slash who have executive power. And there were more and more citizens that were getting pushed into the cities. We might call that like, you know, getting more urban as a society, but also in part it was caused by the spread of slavery out in the agricultural system. Because let's imagine if you bring back a thousand slaves from your war in the sort of area of Greece and you can pay those people zero and you could have them work on your farm. Why would you pay anyone to work on your farm if you had free labor to do so? So all of those former, and then you could also use all of that really cheap uh, grain that you're producing to force all of the uh, small farmers who couldn't do it as cheaply out of business and then take their farms from them. So they were migrating, meaning they were moving into the city, all of these small farmers, and they did not have things to do. So they were unemployed. This is a problem. This made people rather... Uh, they tended to get upset because Rome had been based on this idea of all these individual farmers, like leading their own lives and being independent. Uh, but if you're not an independent farmer, you can be swayed to the opinions of the, the like the big men. So um, this is a, a quote from a Roman poet. And uh, it says, give them bread and circuses and they'll never revolt. Basically, give them food and or money and also give them a spectacle, something to watch and see, like, I don't know, a gladiator fight. And uh, they'll never revolt. And also maybe they'll love you and follow you and uh, support you in a civil war. Who knows? And another problem that was going on is there was a pattern of inflation, meaning the currency, the money of Rome, was getting less and less valuable per individual bit over time. It was devalued. And that was in part caused by the influx of wealth and also changes in this trading system and lots of these other things that were happening as a result of the expansion. And during this somewhat tumultuous time, there came into power these three men, the first triumvirate, who essentially agreed to rule Rome together. It was Crassus, the wealthiest man by far in Rome, on the far left there, Julius Caesar, uh, powerful and uh, you know politically powerful, and then later famous as a, a military victor, and then Pompey Magnus, who was uh, 
potentially like one of the most famous Roman generals. And at first they held each other kind of in an easy, like nobody's too powerful. We're all just keeping each other in check kind of thing. And then Crassus dies and then Pompey and Caesar immediately go to war and Julius Caesar succeeds. He wins in the end and basically takes power as a full on dictator until he is assassinated. And the civil war that took place over the power of uh, Julius Caesar uh, again, between Pompey and Caesar, really set up a pattern for later wars uh, that we'll see as part of the rise of the empire. So the Roman Republic, in the face of all of these changes in economic conditions and social stuff, and especially their political uh, turmoil that was going on, they succumbed, meaning they gave in to civil war, like they, they sort of slid into it. And instead of having a republic, you had an imperial regime with an emperor at the top and then all of the people who followed the emperor underneath, which was a very different way of running things. And here's generally how that happened. So Augustus Caesar, who, yes, is a, rel uh, a relative of Julius Caesar, uh, defeated Mark Antony. They had basically set up like a, almost like another little duo system between the two of them, and they had defeated a third person. But uh, Mark Antony then goes to war with Augustus Caesar, and it's another civil war. But Augustus Caesar comes out on top. And he does a thing that you always need to do if you want to establish an empire as an emperor, and that is live a while. So he lives a while and is able in that time to reduce the power of every person who is not the emperor and to establish a lot of the patterns for how the emperor is going to act later on. And the imperial authority, meaning the ability of an emperor and his followers to exact control over the whole area, uh, became rather powerful and unified and the military got larger and larger and expanded further and further the uh, territory. The problem was that unlike a monarchy where it's like, yeah, the son of the person in charge is going to be the person afterwards. In this case, there was not really a good plan for how to get the next emperor. And so you have examples in the later empire uh, period of the year of the five emperors, where it was just em emperor after emperor after emperor is put in place and then assassinated and put in place and then assassinated, mostly by his own guards, the uh, uh, who were p part of the military forces. So mm, mm, that's a problem. We can see here, I think this map is really cool, and I'm going to let it run, and I understand that might make this video a little large, but okay, so Rome's expanding here, expands over uh, to the Northlands, gets into Spain, ah, then after the Punic Wars expands there, and then wars in Greece, and then the Mithridatic Wars, and then uh, the conquering of Gaul, and then look, we're into the Empire period, that's why it turned purple, and look how far it's expanding, by 140, by 230, we're getting up to the largest extent, it starts to fall back, it has this crisis uh, during that period, and then it splits, notice it splits into two, yeah, and then the part on the uh, western side just like falls apart but the part of the eastern side sticks around and then tries to expand back out and then fails and then fails harder and fails a little harder and gets smaller and smaller and bigger and smaller um so that's the story of the roman empire in a really short period of time um basically the roman empire spread itself out super super far across the world and you can see how long the Byzantine Empire, it's called over here, the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, just continues on as a little tiny version of itself. But it started so small and just expanded in Italy and then explodes across the entire Mediterranean area. And that's what, part of why it becomes so influential, is because it spread so far and lasted so long compared to the other empires uh, that have sprung up in these areas. You can see here Rome at its greatest extent. They were in uh, what is now England and Wales up here and even a little bit into Scotland with the a border between the two up there. Uh, they were over here in Spain and all along the coast of North Africa, had control of Egypt and the Middle East, uh, chunks of it over here and, you know, Asia Minor and even all the way over here in what was, you know, Babylon, right? Sumeria, those areas, Mesopotamia. And uh, they expanded in northward along these borders and there were lots of Germanic peoples living up here who were being pushed back by them. So it was a huge empire at its greatest extent, huge. And within the empire, think about it. All the people who used to live in these areas, well, who lived in these areas, used to think of themselves as separate, part of something different. And they fought with each other all of the time. So sure, there were civil wars in Rome. They fought with places that were outside of the empire. But all of these places that used to fight each other were in a thing called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And it was two centuries of peace and prosperity under imperial rule the empire solidified, like got more organized, got more controlled, got better infrastructure, and 
this allowed a flowering of culture and of you know the economy and things like that. So from you know Egypt, we can see Alexandria that was Roman here, and also modern day area of London, so super far away from each other, had Roman cities that had a lot of similar features. You will notice some similarity in the design of those paintings, and. This, the economic impact was that there was a uniform system of money, which made trade a lot easier. Uh, uniform meaning like you could go anywhere and use Roman coins. Uh, there was safe travel on the Roman roads, which is huge. They reduced you know, the danger of being robbed, which meant it was easier to travel, which meant it was easier to, to do trade. And that promoted prosperity, meaning the gathering of wealth and raised standard of living, and stability. You as a person could predict that if you made such and such decision in the future, you will make money having done it. And that is a big deal. Uh, the social impact of this period was it was a a period of adding some stability to the social class system, which had been in a little bit of an uproar at the, the time of their expansion. But as they got to their whole uh, large state, you were able to see a stratification that organized itself in a way that it was at least it, it worked for them. And there was an increased emphasis on the family. They also created a civil service. You might recognize that as being similar to the idea from ancient China, right? So Han Dynasty China and the Roman Empire were in, well, the Romans were around at the same time. And they set up the civil service, which again is a system for having official paid people who help run the government because it needs to be rather large to manage a large empire. And also that uniform system of laws like we saw last time, which started out in the 12 tables, but, but developed into a really elaborate system of laws. And you could expect to be treated pretty similarly in any part of the empire under the empire's laws, which again made things more predictable and less, I don't know, uh, unsettled and terrifying like a lot of the ancient world. Uh, but over a period of about 300 years, the like, Western part of the empire started to decline because of some internal and external problems. I would point out one over here that I've never seen such a cool uh, graph, but look, here's the amount of silver in a Roman coin. And you can see it suddenly plummets at one point and then goes down. But look at what's happening in that time frame. That's the period in time where emperors are being killed rather than dying a natural death or just leaving the throne. Look, in, in this period, you if you were an emperor, you had an 84% chance of being killed. And look how quickly their currency value drops. So this is the problem, right? Your economic system is deeply connected to your political system. And as a result, when their political system was in turmoil, their economics also suffered. Because they had gotten so huge, it was really difficult to defend the whole thing. It was very expensive, and it was difficult to administer it. There were no phones. There was no email. So it was really hard to just know what was going on, make decisions in a timely manner, and make that happen because Rome was very centralized, meaning it had a lot of uh, its decision-making happening in one place. And over time, similar to how the Republic fell, you see a devaluation of Roman currency. That's, that's what's happening in this graph right here. Where there's less and less silver in it, it is worth less and less per coin. And... They increasingly had to rely on folks who were not Roman citizens to be in the military and defend their borders. And the actual, you know, the Roman populations of places started to decline because as the Roman Empire got bigger and bigger, and as it got more and more organized and also more and more urbanized, more densely populated, that's a real good breeding ground for uh, diseases in a time before antibiotics or an a, actual understanding of the germ theory of disease. That's a real problem. And also there were civil wars and there were these periods of really, really weak emperors and weak administrations. And then there were some major climate changes that were pushing more and more people and also some invasion changes that were pushing people into Rome's borders and Rome did not deal with that well. So eventually the Western and Eastern half, in order to try and deal with this problem of how do you control all of this territory and administer it, they're like, well, let's divide it in half and let's have four people in charge instead of just one. And uh, that kind of worked. But the second capital you can see was established over here at a place called Byzantium. Uh, and it was established by a guy called Constantine. And so he renamed it Constantinople, you know, like you do. And the Western Roman Empire survived until about 476 AD when Rome, they no longer had an emperor. They had already been invaded multiple times and lost a lot of territory. Like It wasn't going well for them. And the Eastern Roman Empire, though, which would later become called the Byzantine Empire, just because it's easier to remember as a separate name, and it's based on Byzantium, right? So the Byzantine Empire. Uh, that lasted for a lot longer, as you saw earlier. Now, 
that's what you need to know as a big, broad overview of Rome. And I hope you thought it was interesting. And we'll go into some more depth on the people and places and stuff in class. Thank you.